could talk about various other belief systems. During this time, we've been talking about beliefs that come into Christianity and actually take away the gospel from Christianity that are a divergent gospel. So in our study, we began with the one true gospel. We said we have to know what the one true gospel is. And I want you to look at these with me real quick. We've said that there's five gospel threads. Now, these are going to be important for us again tonight. So notice them. Look at them. The more times we see these, and there's, there's, you, you could make a case for making more of these um, and even reducing some, but these are five that have been outlined here that are pretty good. And the picture is the five gospel threads of the true gospel are the character of God, who God is. He is holy, and he is just, and he is loving. Again, many other things we could add to that, but the character of God is very important in true Christianity. The sinfulness of man. We are not predisposed to do the right thing. We are predisposed to do the wrong thing. How many of you have ever had to teach one of your children to do the wrong thing? Did, Mrs. Mulberry, did you have to teach Jack to do the wrong thing? No, you didn't. Jack naturally did the wrong thing. We all naturally did the wrong thing when we were growing up. You have to teach children to do the right thing. And even in doing that, they still need the grace and the forgiveness of God before a holy God because they have offended him. They have been born into a sinful fallen world. So true Christianity looks at that very, very plainly and very, very carefully. Number three, the sufficiency of Christ. The fact that Christ is totally sufficient to solve our problem with God. He is the perfect sacrifice. What are some of the reasons that Christ is totally sufficient to solve our problem with God, our sin problem with God? Just name a couple of them. What are some of the reasons Jesus can solve our problem? He had no sin, so he was perfect. What else? Thank you. Who said that? Lift your hand. He's God. (laughs) So because he is God, he can solve our problem with God. So this is God in the flesh. So Those are really the two main ones that we would look at. But because he is God, he has the power of God. He is is not bound by sin and death as we are. And so when we have Christ, the power to break and to cancel our sin um, comes to us. So he is completely sufficient. He is the perfect sacrifice to do that. Number four, the necessity of faith. Um, we must have faith in God. We must have faith in Christ specifically. We must have faith in what Jesus did. As Derek said in his testimony Sunday, it's all about what Jesus did, not the fact that we are trying to do things. It's, it's, It's do versus done. And Jesus said, it is finished. It is done. I have finished this. And, uh, because of that, we are now free to do good works. Um, in faith. So number five, the urgency of eternity, the fact that eternity is coming, Um, and there's either heaven or there is hell. Now, all five of these, as we have been looking at theological liberalism, theological liberalism attacks all five of these. Theological liberalism brings a different view on every single one of these, that it's a different view on the nature and the character of God. Is God truly sovereign? Is he truly powerful? Is he truly good? Is he truly all-knowing? Is he truly um, transcendent of time and space? Um, all, of, all of those kinds of things. The sinfulness of man. Uh, theological liberalism um, comes to say, well, you know, man is a, is a creation of his environment, and his environment isn't good, and, you know, he's, his heart is actually basically good. He's better than his environment. Um, the, in the heart of man, you know, the, so the, just exact opposite tenets of these things. Jesus, his sufficiency, to, well, Jesus was a great moral teacher, and the real power of Jesus was in his moral teaching, not in the essence of who he was. Well, those things are false. If Jesus was just a good moral teacher, then he's not going to rise from the dead. Um, so, uh, necessity of faith, they would, they would be saying, like all of the others, it's more about what you do, and what is the, what is the real issue here um, is that you do the right thing and that you, you simply um, seek to be a good person, and um, your, your real theological things are borne out in what you're going to do, not so much um, your, your deep convictions and your faith. Um, and then when it comes to heaven and hell, 
um, theological liberalism doubts both. And in fact, there's a fair amount of theological liberalism that would even come into um, not even believing in an eternity. Um, that's where some of that road leads to uh, when we wind up coming out of that altogether. So, so not only do we look at the one true gospel, we also look at the one true God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons in one, each person fully God, and there is one God. Week three, we looked how um, we identify cults and counterfeit gospels, and we read two passages of Scripture that were very important, and I want you to see this. Second John chapter 7 says, "'For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Christ, Jesus Christ in the flesh, such as one is the deceiver and antichrist. So these deceivers, have been, we've been warned that the deceivers are coming. And that deceive, Jude says the deceivers are here. And we, we saw that 2,000 years ago it was true. Uh, Jesus had warned that they would come. And then we see just in the first 30 years of Christian faith, we see many deceivers um, really spreading out. Jude chapter 3 and verse 4 say it, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about your, our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that once for all was delivered to the saints. You see, this is a once for all deliverance that we've, that we've gotten of the gospel. It doesn't need to be added to. It doesn't need to be anything else. Verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. See, that's prosperity gospel. We talked about that. Or into just intellectual intrigue. That can be uh, classical liberalism or uh, Christian, uh, liberal uh, Christianity is this idea of perverting the gospel, playing on the senses, um, and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what classical liberalism does. It denies Jesus as master and Lord. And so um, these are deviations. We also looked at Mormonism. We also looked at Jehovah's Witnesses. We looked at Roman Catholicism. And uh, even as we, we saw some of that played out over the last few weeks as Notre Dame um, burned, and um, then we, we came to just kind of hear and see the prosperity gospel and how this is a very, very evident thing all around us. We've heard two or three testimonies recently in our church of people who were in the prosperity gospel, who've come out of the prosperity gospel. That's part of um, even Derek, uh, Derek's experience, had a family member that was very powerful, a, a lady who was a preacher um, and very, very much into really a Pentecostal uh, prosperity gospel. And Derek was looking at it and saying, oh, wow, what is this? And it was very confusing um, for a period of time. Um, and so then we've come to this idea of theological liberalism. Do you have your notes? I hope you have your notes. Uh, and uh, let's just kind of look and see once again. Um, we, we start on page 105, what is it? We're talking about liberalism. Is, we're not talking about, a, and this is on page 105, we're not talking about political views. We're talking about views on theology that are not consistent with Scripture. Um, so um, that's, that's what we're not talking about is political views. We're talking about things that deny. And, and here we are. It says, what are we talking about? That first one there, people who call themselves Christians yet deny the Scripture. That's what that blank is. They deny the Scripture, and that's the biggest problem is that they, they deny the Scripture. Um, they adapt to a changing culture. They feel like nobody wants to believe this anymore, so we have to adapt the views. That's what the theologians very often will do. They will adapt to a changing culture, and they want to appeal to an increasingly non-Christian non culture. Now, next week, we're going to start another section in this that is dealing with syncretism and contextualization. And this is what has affected us very powerfully in the last 30 years. Um, Christianity has, has gone through this, American and Western Christianity has gone through, uh, as a culture, um, a great twisting that we would say, well, wait a minute, it's not theological liberalism, and it's not even necessarily prosperity gospel, and many times it's not even necessarily a radical charismatic gospel or Pentecostalism. It is actually just a twisting 
of the more orthodox regular mainline churches. And so we, we want to be sensitive to that. Um, and we're going to be talking about that in the next couple of weeks. But right now we're talking about theological liberalism that at a philosophical level, level and at a theological level, um, that which tends to want to adapt and appeal. Um, so the, the thing appears to be biblical, but it actually undercuts scripture. It claims to be new and contemporary, and it actually rehashes old heresies. All that's on 105. So there were seven problems. We looked at the seven problems. Let's run through them really quick. I had you put a one, two, three, four out next to the dark bullet points. Bottom of page 105 was the first one, and it was theological liberalism rejects the final authority of God's word. It elevates experiences and other things, and it elevates science, but it rejects the primacy and the, the inerrancy of God's word. Look at the number two. Theological liberalism on page 106. Number two right there, the dark dot at the top. Theological liberalism rejects God's supernatural and miraculous work in history. So they, they just simply, they come to the place saying, we don't accept the supernatural, and so anything in the Bible that's really dealing with the supernatural, oh, it's metaphorical, it's, it's some type of literary thing, it's, um, it, it's really hyperbole, it's really not true. It didn't really mean that the ax had floated didn't really mean that the lame man got up and walked, didn't really mean that Jesus walked on the water. The Red Sea was actually, it was a place where a wind was there, time of drought, different circumstances, ocean levels were lower, and the nation of Israel walked through on dry ground. It couldn't really mean that the waters gathered up on each side, and, uh, and they, or they would say that they walked through on a marsh. Um, but the scripture clearly says the water was gathered up on both sides, and they walked through on dry ground. It was God showing that he's God and delivering his people. And so theological liberalism would just say no to, to really all of that. Um, look at number three there. Theological liberalism rejects the seriousness of individual sin before a holy God. You see, this is once again those, those key tenets um, that we said of the true gospel, the sinfulness of man. They would say, ah, not really. Uh, number four, in the middle of page 106, theological liberalism rejects the Bible's teaching on the person and work of Christ. So he's not really the all-sufficient uh, sacrifice for us. There's a, there's a confusion about that, that, you know, did he really die on the cross? Did he really rise again? It was more his moral teachings, you know, the, many different views on, on that. Number five in the middle of the page, theological liberalism rejects the Bible's teaching on judgment and eternity. So, you know, is heaven really real? Is hell really real? It's really not that serious. And it's kind of interesting how many will gravitate toward heaven being real and hell not being real. I mean, we, we all like the idea that, we, you know, finally, you know, if God's really God, things are going to get better um, when you die. And, um, you know, it's, it's just not going to, to be this issue of judgment and a, um, a condemnation of you in this. So it de-emphasizes the holiness and the wrath of God. Um, number six out there, theological liberalism rejects certain teachings in Scripture when they become unpopular or ridiculed. So that's the idea. The more unpopular it becomes to talk about a moral issue, a marriage issue, even, even having to do with wealth and materialism. You know, there's certain places in the United States that it's, it's just really unpopular to talk about um, Christians needing to be sacrificial. And, um, I mean, do we really need to live in all of the wealth that we live in? Do we need to have God's view on our money? Well, you start talking about that, and people start saying, you're stepping on toes, so, I mean, there's, there's various things that when they become unpopular, suddenly people don't want to hear them. Um, and there's a lot of different aspects of there uh, concerning new mores. But the sexual revolution is one of the most prominent ones. Um, number seven, bottom of page 106, number seven, theological liberalism rejects consistent teachings from the church throughout history. So the fact that the church has held on to Christian teaching and it comes to say, ah, it doesn't matter that Christians have believed this for 2,000 years. Ah, these are new age. This is scientific age. This is the age of modernism. Um, this is a, a real time of enlightenment for us. We've kind of gone through the intellectual enlightenment, 
and now we're coming into the scientific enlightenment, and now really some would say the enlightenment of knowledge, um, having knowledge available at your fingertips. There's almost nothing you can't instantly find out um, through Google. I mean, you can find out, you know, uh, you just you name it, you start Googling the right thing, searching the right thing, you can find an amazing amount of knowledge. And some would say, well, our salvation winds up being in, our, in the great knowledge that we have available to us, and that's God in itself, and so forth. Well, how should we deal with the, uh, theological liberalism? This is an important question for us, because you're going to deal with it. Um, you're going to deal with it either um, knowingly or unknowingly, and I would rather you be aware of it and to know exactly how we should or should not deal with it. Um, first of all, let me just say that there are a couple of books that are really, really important. One particular, and I've, I've included, I think, two different copies um, of the cover of it, and this is available in our bookstore. Um, this is Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gresham Machen. And Machen was a theologian um, in the Northeast, and he saw modernism knocking the chocks out from underneath um, orthodox Christianity. What I mean by that is the orthodox view of the Bible, the view of Scripture that had been long-held Christian tenets. He, had been, he's a, he was a scholar and a theologian, and he was sitting there saying, just because a guy in England came up with this idea of evolution that is being really heralded and Huxley comes along and comes behind it and really megaphones it and everybody else, everybody is just walking away from 2,000 years of Christian belief based upon these thinking and, and wrongly perceiving that these are in conflict with the Bible. And so Gresham started looking, he said, I don't want to get into the, all of the arguments that are flying around today, I just want to clearly state what true Christian doctrine is. And so in 1921, he dealt with this. In 1921, he wrote this book, Theological Christianity and Theological Liberalism, and I want to read for you um, just a statement or two that is here. He says, in the sphere of religion in particular, the present time is a time of conflict. The great redemptive religion, which has always been known at Christi as, Christianity, as Christianity, is battling against a totally diverse type of religious belief, which is only the more destructive of the Christian faith because it makes use of traditional Christian terminology. This modern non-redemptive religion is called modernism or liberalism. And so it, he's talking about this theological liberalism that is using Christian terms but meaning very different things. And this went off through the universities and through the seminaries, made its way into the hearts of pastors to the point where even back in the 20s, there were many pastors that were no longer teaching a clear gospel based upon what the Scripture says. They were teaching a confused gospel that was being filtered through mo what we call modernity or the modern way in thinking. Um, that continued to get worse and worse and worse right on through um, the early 20th century. Right on through the 1900s, that, that became a greater and greater problem. Um, and so that's what this is a response to as we look at that. How do we seek to deal with this? Um, notice here with me um, number one. And I, I want to, again, I want you to just put a big number one out there next to that where it says recognize theological liberalism for what it is a non Christian religion. So theological li liberalism is not Christianity. There are so many people. I spoke with someone this week who came into the office, sat down, we had a long talk, and she said, I have all of these discussions with people right here in Hollywood, and we argue about who Jesus was, and they go to church every single Sunday. In fact, one of them is a pastor, and she said that he argues against the deity of Christ. So here we are, 
right here in Hollywood just this week sitting down with one of our church members and she has discussions all the time that are involving theological liberalism. Because so that's that's when when you start doubting who Jesus is, when you start saying, "Well, there's many ways to God; that he's, there's not there's not just one way to God." Because Jesus clearly clearly said that all of Scripture shows us that. When we start looking at all of these different doubts on Scripture, doubts on the character of God, doubts on who Jesus is and what He did, doubts on the need of the human soul, as you can have that discussion on any park bench here in the in the in South Florida. Um, that is, it, it's, it's not Christianity. And we need to be quick to say that. It's, it's liberalism um, or Christian liberalism, but it is not true biblical Christianity. Uh, look at Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6 through 10. Look what it says. I am astonished, and Paul's writing to the Galatians, and look what he writes. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to, look what it says, underline that, a what? See, it's not the same thing. A different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. You see, this is a 2,000-year-old problem. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Underline that. And for am I now seeking the approval of man or God? The same pressures that caused people to stop holding on to the gospel 2,000 years ago, as in people don't like this. They don't approve of this. Are the same pressures that in the late 1800s caused people to start walking away from preaching the gospel. The pulpits of England and some of the pulpits of America and the more elite churches were sitting, they were starting to stop preaching the gospel clearly, saying who God is, man's problem, who Christ is, the realities of eternity. All of those things started to be doubted. Could it really be? I mean, Christian liberalism comes in, and then it continues to morph into more and more things where we see the even, even evangelicalism, or the people who traditionally went against Christian liberalism, the evangelicals who typically held on to the gospel of Christ, even those, as we're going to see next week and the next week, even those through contextualization and syncretization, we see that they start abandoning the gospel. And it's all over the fact that people don't want to hear it. People don't like it. People don't agree with it. And so they go to change the message. We see that right here in Galatians. For am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I mean, think about that. Why would Paul say that? Why would Paul say that? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be. What does he mean by that? Okay, he was persecuted heavily as a Christian. What was he as a Jew? Talking to the Apostle Paul, what kind of Jew was he? He was a Pharisee. And what else? How else do we describe him very often? Okay, he, he was a murderer, but he was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was trained in the school of Gamaliel. He was obviously very, very brilliant. I mean, we're talking, Paul was set up possibly to wind up being a chief priest, or at least at a very, very high order. And he leaves all of that, and he comes to follow Christ, and he preaches the gospel of Christ, and he's beaten and run from town to town, and even Christians would sometime come up against him, right? And so he's saying, look, if I was still trying to please man, I would not be a Christian, but I've come to realize that, that Christ is the whole picture here. So we, we just need to, Paul very clearly says, look, when you start, when you start uh, denying who Christ is, you're not in Christianity anymore. 
And we need to see that. So J. Gresham Machem, the, and this is the guy who wrote the book, the, the, the uh, gray square box that is there. Notice this. It comes out of the, here. Despite the liberal use of traditional phraseology, modern liberalism not only is a different religion from Christianity, but it belongs to a totally different class of religions. So it's not even in the same ballpark. And we need to be very, very careful to recognize that. Um, and, and here's, here's where we're going to explain that a little bit. The next one there is A, so this is a sub-point underneath number one, so that little clear dot is an A. The root of theological liberalism is unbelief. It is, it is more about what they don't believe. It is unbelief in the Word of God. It is unbelief in the character of God. It is unbelief in the nature of Christ. It is unbelief in the issue of heaven and hell. It is unbelief in the issue of salvation by grace through faith alone in, the, in Christ alone. It is more about unbelief than it is about belief. This is the exaltation of human thought over God's thought. So humanity and human intellectualism supersedes the word of God. Um, C.S. Lewis would write this. Notice here, it says, liberal Christianity can only supply an ineffectual echo to the massive chorus of agreed and admitted, and admitted unbelief. Don't be deceived by the fact that this echo so often hits the headlines. This is because attacks on Christian doctrine which would pass unnoticed if they were launched, as they were daily launched, by anyone else, comes news from the attacker is a clergyman. Just as, ev just as a very commonplace protest against makeup would be news if it came from a film star. By the, by the way, did you ever meet or hear of anyone who was converted from skepticism to liberal or demythologized Christianity? I think that when unbelievers come in at all, they come in a good deal further. He's saying people don't want to come to a dead, lifeless, um, teethless, uh, toothless Christianity. They want to come to true Christianity. People who, I mean, here's the deal. Theological liberalism is just dying. It's nothing to believe. You're going to get together and talk about what all you don't believe? I mean, this is why mainline churches, went, which went the way of theological liberalism, are disappearing. This is the why. The, this is the reason the properties are being sold. This is the reason the, why the buildings are falling down. I mean, the picture behind even our phrase there is a is a rotted out church that once had a glorious edifice. This is why even here in Hollywood, since I've come back in seven years, I know of numerous churches that boarded up and sold out and are not even there anymore, that have become something else. Um, and we would say some of those are Baptist churches. Some of those are Methodist churches, mainline Methodist churches. Some of those are mainline Presbyterian churches. We have churches down on US, high, uh, US 1 that wound up changing and changing because the mainline denominations have just been failing and falling. And part of the reason is why. They have no gospel. There is no hope. And so as soon, here's Eric Metaxas said this uh, yesterday on television on a news interview. Some of you know who Eric Metaxas is. He's a, a writer. He was a, he was a writer for The New Yorker. He's a strong Christian. Um, he wrote a book on, on Bonhoeffer, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a couple of years ago. But Metaxas said this. He, he was saying, what happens is theological, theological liberalism comes into mainline churches and people continue going through the motions of church for a while, but then as the culture around us, there's no more pressure on the, as the culture around us to continue to walk in Christianity. In fact, more people are not walking in Christianity than the people that are sitting in the church that don't even know what they believe, that in fact are starting to say, well, I don't really believe that. They stop going to church. Why am I going to go to church? I don't even believe that. And so instead of being taught the gospel and being taught why the gospel is true, and instead of being grown in Christian disciplines to seek after God in a fallen world and to see his goodness, instead of all of that being what our hearts are fired for, to get together and talk about what we don't believe and to get together and talk about being good winds up becoming something that 
um, causes us to, to simply have no reason to meet at all. And so unbelief is the theological root um, that is in uh, theological liberalism. Look at letter B at the bottom of page 107. It says the answer to theological liberalism is regeneration. The answer to theological liberalism is regeneration. What do we mean by that? Flip the page and look at John chapter 3 in verse 38, or, or verses 3 through 8. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Underline that. Unless one is born again. He cannot see. See, this is regeneration. You've got to be regenerated. That's what born again means. You've got to be made new. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Spirit, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The picture is, is that God is going to save who he wants to save. He's going to work how he wants to work to draw people into himself, and he does this in order to see us made completely new. Um, we studied a book called uh, Salvation, and um, does anybody remember what chapter one did any of you guys, what, 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 Pastor Lucas is shaking his head, I think. Uh, what was chapter one on that? We need to be what, but uh, not be one thing, but be the other things. Anybody remember? Not, not nice, but new. Ooh, that's it. Not nice, but new. You know, liberal Christianity says you need to be nice. Go be nice. Go be nice. Go be nice. Be nice. Be good. But what Pastor Lucas is reminding us here is... No, the true gospel says you need to be made new. You, you, you need to be made new. That's being reborn. That's being born again. This is the importance of conversion to faith in Jesus. This is the importance of forsaking our sin and walking away from a life of unbelief and a life of living for ourselves to living for Christ. And that's what the true gospel calls us to. And so what are we to do? We are to embrace regeneration. What is the answer to theological liberalism? You need to be saved. You need to be saved out of your unbelief. It's just, it's really dangerous because it's Christian unbelief, as so to speak. It's, it's, that's what Machem is saying here, is that all the terminology is Christian. And that's why it's such a problem. Um, and it's why it's so dangerous. Um, look at number two here. And this is right there in the middle of page 102, that dark dot that's there. Go ahead and put a big number two next to that reject theological, theological liberalism when you read it in a book or hear it in the church. You need to reject it when you read it in a book or you hear it in a church. It, hear it in a church. When you start to see that doubt is being cost on the veracity of Scripture, on the, on the truthfulness of Scripture, when you start to see that the, the, the elevation of man is being lifted. And they usually don't say God isn't so powerful. What they usually do is continue to elevate the intellect and the reasoning and the heart and the intentions and the motivations of mankind. And they will elevate man and de-elevate God or ignore God when those kinds of things, you know, it's all about you. Um, we have this actually a lot going on in Christian books right now. And, and some of it has to do with prosperity gospel. Some of it has to do with some of the other things that we've already talked about a little bit. But just even recently, the pastors um, were looking at some videos and some books um, that are very, very powerful in women's ministry um, right now. And they, they are high, they're, they're like self-help motivational books with a Christian veneer on them and they are dangerous to women. Because number one, they're appealing to women to want to go do all of these things and to be really, quite honestly, it's like Maslow's self-actualization, just a, a, a complete drive um, for, for women to be fulfilled in something other than God. Um, and it's, it's a very dangerous thing, and it even passes off through moralistic teaching and um, 
uh, really a very, very human-centered theology. If when you start to read that, you need to reject it. And let me tell you, if this pulpit ever teaches that, you need to stand up and walk out. You really should. I mean, you, you should not tolerate a small view of God and then a large view of mankind. You should not tolerate a view of God and an understanding of Christ that is not completely biblical. You should not tolerate any moral teaching that is seeking to be a chameleon with the culture that is surrounding us. We are to embrace the culture of God, not have God come to change our culture, expect God's um, standards to change for our culture. Um, look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. This charge I trust you, uh, I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Huh. Wage the good warfare. You see, this is a battle. This, is, this isn't, you know, um, playing patty cake. I mean, this is a battle. Holding faith and a good conscience. And look what, he, look what he says after that. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So here are guys who went into false beliefs, wrong belief, and they're called out by the Apostle Paul for all of Christian history to see. They're called out by God. Um, you don't want to be a theological, you know, the, this is a place where two guys are mentioned because of their wrong beliefs, and there's another place where two ladies are mentioned because they're not getting along with each other. You don't want to be those people that are named in Scripture, right? Um, well, uh, let's skip on down um, to number three, down at the bottom. Number three, trust the Word of God. How do we deal with it? Trust the Word of God over human wisdom and experience and reason. We need to trust the Word of God over human wisdom, experience, and reason. Look at Psalm 119 and verse 6. It says, Then I shall not put, excuse me, then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. So I fix my eyes on his commandments, and I'll never be ashamed of that. You're never ashamed by embracing God's word. Um, this is a key issue for our, our beliefs upon biblical uh, counseling. We need biblical answers to our problems in life. We don't necessarily need Freudian or Carl Jungian, or Maslowian, or any other modern psychology things being the dominant force in how we interpret our problems in life. We need the Bible to show us how to deal with God. We need the Bible to show, excuse me, the Bible to show us how to deal with life. Um, and that's, that's a very powerful thing. Um, there are some aspects of modern psychology that can be helpful, but when modern psychology replaces the Word of God, you have a big problem in solving your problems. So it just compounds it. Um, we want to be careful to be turning to what God's Word says. So um, look at this letter A down there at the bottom of page 108. So this is a clear dot, so that'll be letter A. We are prone to suppress truth. We are prone toward not embracing the truth. We are prone to be deceived. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 there on the next page. For the wrath of God is revealed from, against he from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, look what it says, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Underline that. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We do that in our flesh. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So what he's saying is creation shows you that there's a God, and creation shows you the type of God that he is, his power, his majesty, his grandeur, his love for beauty, his, his creativity, his engineering um, his, his sense of humor. I mean, I mean, how many animals have you seen on PBS and gone, that is hysterical. You see bugs and the things that they do, and you go, 
Wow. Why, if, you, if you're a diver and you like to dive under the water and, and you see reef fish and you see what fish do, you go, God has a sense of humor. Um, and, and so we, he's saying here, there's, there's all of these invisible attributes about God um, that show us, and look what it goes on to say, so in the middle of the paragraph, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God. So they had the the glory of the immortal God that they could see and worship. And what did they trade it for? For images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping Things. What does that mean at the end? Look what it says. Okay, idols. I mean, they, they're 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 trading the true God for carved images, and you just you just look at that and you go, that's so stupid. I mean, but you know, before we get too hard on that, there's a lot of people, and maybe some of you have have come out of this, I hope, or maybe you're struggling with it now, you've, you've traded it for a brick and mortar house, or you've traded it for something with four rubber things on it that goes down the road. I mean, you know, you, you, maybe it's, you can have other gods. They don't have to be a Buddha. They don't have to be a totem. They can be um, something that is in this life that we, we worship these other things. Letter B, that other clear dot that's there. Um, so we are to trust God over human wisdom. Letter B is we are limited in our understanding. We're prone to suppress the truth, and we are limited in our understanding. We need to recognize that. And in humility, when we, are, when we recognize that we're limited in our understanding, then we begin to see the greater things of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 19. Now this I say and testify in, to the, in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. See, that's just like Romans above it. They've been darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Wow. Due to their, underline that, due to their hardness of heart. See, the heart is ultimately the problem. There are some people who can see God right in front of them. Jesus would do miracles right in front of them, and they would still not believe. And why? Because they have a hard heart. They became callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So they're they're wanting to do the wrong thing. They're wanting to live in a, cor- in, a, in a way that is not in accordance with what God has designed. They're, that's what it means when it says greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That means they, they want to go out and be vile in the way that they sin. And I just, I, it's amazing that they wanted to do that in Ephesus um, 2,000 years ago, and my goodness, they want to do that now. I mean, in, I'm just very disturbed by even just basic television programming, sometimes just the news or even just the commercials where you hear that which is evil just being lauded is so great. I mean, I saw, a, I saw an interview um, with, somebody help me out, uh, Jarvay, Ricky Jarvay. Do you know who Ricky Jarvay is? He was the, he was the creator of The Office, uh, the show called The Office. And Ricky Gervais, in a, in a debate or a discussion with a couple of different people, I, I saw him say, well, you know, they, they were saying, wait a minute, so you don't believe in God, you, you wouldn't choose God, I mean, so what would you worship? If you could worship anything, what, do you, what would you worship? And what would you, cho- no, the question was, what would you choose to worship over God? You know what he said? Dogs. Dogs, dogs are great. Dogs love you no matter what you do. You talk about unconditional love, you can hate a dog and it'll still come up and lick you. Dogs are, you know, dogs, 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 dogs. But when he said dogs, do you know what the crowd did? Uproarish applause. Now friends, we got to understand that the world is darkened in their understanding. 
Now, if you really get into the show The Office and you love the show The Office, it would be very good for you to know that the man who created that show and edited that show and produced that show and was the brainchild behind that whole show, making sure that that show season after season after season that you get involved with, that you think is hysterical, that that man's spirituality is that he would rather worship a dog than worship God. And you can rest assured that that's going to subtly make its way into every script and every thought that's there. You better be aware. Um, my friends, we, we need to recognize that, that we are prone to suppress the truth. We are prone to our limited understanding. Look at letter C here with that clear dot, letter C. God is infinitely wise, absolutely truthful, absolutely truthful, and perfectly faithful. That's who God is. So if we're going to not succumb to human wisdom um, and experience and reason over the Word of God, we need to recognize that God is the one who is truly um, wise and truthful and perfectly faithful. Number four down there at the bottom of page 109, teach the Word of God with honest compassion. How should we deal with liberalism? Well, we should teach the Word of God with honest compassion and humble boldness. So this doesn't mean that we run around blasting everyone and haranguing them for what they don't understand and what they don't believe and being, being harsh in every way. You know, there's some people that live in cleansing the temple mode. There's, there's some denominations that live in cleansing the temple mode. They don't recognize, well, actually, that was one time out of three years of ministry. Actually, Jesus was feeding most of the people who disagreed with him or who were on the fence, who were going to leave him, and he was healing them. And he was, he was compa- and he had, he had tremendous compassion for them. In fact, we see in multiple places, Jesus looks at the people, and he is moved with compassion. Luke chapter 9, you know, he has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so we need to, we need to recognize just because they're wrong doesn't mean they need our ire. They don't need our hatred. What they need is loving, compassionate, bold truth. And by the way, um, boldness doesn't mean necessarily brashness. You don't have to be brash while being strong. In fact, there's a lot of times when you're brash, when you're not even being bold. It's, a, it's, it's actually a, a sign of your own fear and a sign of your own lack of spirituality in that. Um, we don't need to have the right truth and have the wrong attitude. There's a lot of Christians that maybe they have the right truth, but they have the wrong attitude. And the more that Sheridan Hills becomes a biblically-minded church and a biblically-hearted church, we need to recognize that we need to be extremely, extremely compassionate in this process of being who God wants us to be and doing what he wants us to do. Number five, um, believe, at the top of page 110, we need to believe God's supernatural, miraculous works in history. We need to see that he has been working all through history and that, that he has done that since the creation of the world. Um, look down there at Hebrews 11, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Jesus said, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. So look at Hebrews 11, 3. By faith, we understand that the world was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. He, he created ex nihilo. That means he created from nothing. And we accept that and rejoice in that by faith. Look at number six, um, the black dot there, number six. Revere God's holiness. If you're gonna beat theological liberalism, you gotta see God as holy. Revere God's holiness. We need to remember that he is holy. Number seven, we need to recognize our what? Thank you. We need to recognize our sinfulness. So we need to see that God is holy, and we need to see that we are sinful. Look at Romans 3.23. Let's all read it out loud. Everybody, everybody wake up. We're almost done. 
We've got Romans 3.23 says, For Look at 2 Corinthians 4.5. For, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So high view of God, low view of man. This is in keeping with Scripture. Number eight, if we're going to beat theological liberalism, refuse to minimize Refuse to minimize the person and the work of Christ. You have to see Jesus as God. You have to see Jesus as what, he, what the Scripture calls him to be and what he does, that he has done all that he has done. In fact, we looked at Colossians 1, 15 through 20 at the bottom of page 110. We saw that Sunday morning. I preached that passage of him being um, the prototakos, the prototakos, the prototakos, this idea of being preeminent one um, over all things. Look at John 1, verse 14, over at the top of page 111. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word, this is Christ, becomes flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, goes on and on throughout the scripture. We see this over and over again, the high view of who Jesus is and what he did on our behalf. This is the gospel. Look at number nine, that dot that's there in the middle of page 111, number nine. Realize that heaven and hell are at stake in what we believe and teach. Based upon what you believe, you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell based upon what you've done with that. And what are people going to believe? How can people believe unless what? There's a preacher. And so what is preached is very important. That's why we must protect the pulpit. That's why every church must protect what is being preached from the pulpit. A church family must have that as a very high value. This is not just my concern. This is your concern. This is our concern as a church. I, I am to be certainly one of the leaders of the flock, but listen, the flock together, as we see in Scripture, is that we are together called to not tolerate things that are not of God. And so we do that together. I am accountable to you. I am accountable to the Holy Spirit. We are accountable to one another. I call you to be accountable to one another. I call you to be accountable to me and to the leaders of the church. This is the way of Christianity, that we are accountable to God. We're accountable to one another. This is why we observe the Lord's table together. We don't do that individually. We do that together so that we are coming before God, remembering the sacrifice of Christ, holding one another accountable to remembering who Christ is and to live as Christ has called us to live. This is not an individual um, exercise. This is a body exercise of the body of Christ. And heaven and hell is at stake. Number 10. Respect the beliefs of Christians who have gone before us. Now, we're not going to the Roman Catholic view of tradition and that we hold on to traditions for tradition's sake, but we do want to say that when we look at what Christians believe for the last 2,000 years, that should help us determine what we believe. If we're coming up with divergent things from what they believed, we're probably not very smart because we're going with something new. We don't want to do that. When they said, no, Christ was not created by God, he is begotten of God, um, but he is, he is eternally existent. When they had councils together that worked that out, we shouldn't circle back on that now. And there, there's a, a, a multitude of various things like that, that some Christian groups in this day and time, they go against what Orthodox Christianity has worked out for the last 2,000 years in keeping with Scripture. We shouldn't do that. Um, notice this in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 15, underneath that one. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. 
And so we should allow God's word to help us hold on to that which is um, of the gospel and of the truth. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 through 15. But as for you, continue, underline that, continue in what you have heard and le- or what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Again, it's coming from scripture which are able to make you wise for what? Salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You see, this, man, this, we got to hold on to this. This is true. This will save you. You depart from it, and you'll be lost. So respect the beliefs of the Christians that have gone before us and held on to the gospel, not only of Scripture, but also as they have fleshed out Scripture in clear understanding of basic orthodox tenets of Christianity. Number 11, down there at the bottom of page 111, we need to, if we're going to beat cultural liberal or Christian liberalism, we need to risk opposition, ridicule, and even persecution in the culture around you for the sake of Christ in you. We should risk opposition rule and even persecution in the culture around you for the sake of Christ in you. Um, Friends, this is the beautiful picture that he is worth it. And he, do you fear man or do you fear God? Um, Look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Jesus said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the little theological student in in 1921 at Princeton um, who raises his hand and says, I'm sorry, but professor, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he keeps quoting scripture and he's telling the professor, I'm sorry, but you're saying that Jesus wasn't God. And that little theological student gets hammered um, in the liberal theology of Princeton Seminary uh, and a thousand other seminaries around the world. Friends, we are called to stand with what God has called us to in the gospel and not be ashamed of it. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation, everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Um, so th- we, we are to stand in the gospel and to not allow things like theological liberalism sway us away from the gospel. Does this make sense? Does this help you understand why the mainline denominations disappeared? Who wants to get together and talk about what they don't believe? I'd rather get together and talk about what we do believe and about what the belief is that can save us from hell, of a loving God. Why trade humanism for honest worship of God? Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Let me remind you of a couple of things before we go. Number one boot camp registration. Guys, you need to sign up for boot camp tonight. You can do it in the computers in the back. Jeffrey Hoppert's back there. He is ready to help you get signed up. Sign up. It begins May 9th. That's Thursday morning, 6 a.m., Thursday evening, 6 p.m. You choose your poison. I mean, you choose your dinner or your breakfast, um, and we're going to have a great time. Ladies Book Club um, also begins um, right around the corner. Ladies Before the Guys, they're beginning April 29th. Ladies, you can sign up in the back. It's only four weeks. It is great. You need to get connected with people in the church. Uh, That's part of what this is all about. I want to also remind you um, of a couple of other things that are coming up. Um, Starting point is right around the corner. Um, It is Sunday morning, and if you have not become a covenant member of the church, we've been talking about all kinds of things, more and more and more, where you see that you need that. I pray. I want to encourage you to just come at 915. Go register in the back, because we need to know you're coming. Um, Register in the back. Breakfast is served at 9.15. It's a great breakfast put on by some of the ladies. And um, I teach that class. And I want to encourage you who've already been through that. You know what I do on the first session. And so I want to ask you to be praying for Sunday morning at 9.15. Um, And so I really want to encourage you to do that. Pray for us uh, during that time. And uh, so...
praise God. Glad that you've been here tonight. We look forward to Sunday morning. Um, let's uh, pray together before we go out. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Pray that you would go before us. Pray that you would help us to um, live out the, these great truths of the gospel with great passion and with great love, that we would be um, compassionate to those around us who do not understand the truth and that we would be able to share with them the love of Christ by the way that we live and by the things that we believe and say. Lord, thank you for this great evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn and shake hands with somebody that you do not know. Go after somebody you don't know.